Well, good evening, everyone. Nosoy Welcome to the latest in the series of Museum of Welsh Cricket Winter Talks. It's the last one of 2022. And I'm delighted to say that this evening we're linking up across the Atlantic Ocean to the west coast of Canada. And our guest this evening is the one and only Tony Cordell. Good evening, Tony. Oh, good evening, Andrew. How are you? I'm very well. Um, it's it's great to uh, great to see you, and great to hear you. Can I just ask what it's uh, just a turn of seven o'clock in the evening here uh, in the UK? So what what's the time in British Columbia? It is just um, five minutes after eleven in the morning. Brilliant. Yeah, we did. We have done some talks with other people overseas where they've had to get up at six o'clock in the morning. So at least uh, at least we haven't uh, impinged too much on you. We're all really grateful for you taking the time to uh, join us. I've got a few photos just to um, start things off. A few little photos just to share with everyone. And uh, hopefully this will uh, be uh, a, uh, a starting point for maybe what we're going to be uh, talking about um, a little bit uh, later on. Well, here we are, your first year on the Glamorgan staff yes. in uh, 1963. Yes. And here you are uh, having only recently, uh, the year before, having uh, moved from your native Barbados. We'll talk about your early years in Barbados in a minute. But of course, you arrived in 1963, and the oh, captain. 1962. Of... Yeah, but um, I'll yeah. I'll talk about that in a minute, Tony, with your yeah. second eleven record, etc. But okay. uh, your your debut with Glamorgan and uh, signing a full time contract, and you made it immediately into the headlines in 1964, because here you are in the back row with. Uh, a group of, well, a mix of young professionals and very far more experienced Glamorgan cricketers. And everyone there in 1964, in that team, under uh, Aussie Weekly, beating the 1964 Australians who had arrived at Swansea uh, unbeaten under the captaincy of Bobby Simpson. So we'll yeah. talk, Tony, a little bit later on about your memories. So you are. Uh, in August uh, company as one of the few people not only to have beaten the Australians in 1964 but as I'll show you everyone again in a few minutes time again in uh, 1968. Well then in 1967 you were fortunate enough to win your county cap and here you are at Edgbaston uh, sat in front of the old pavilion there at Warwickshire's headquarters. And uh, you won your county cap in 1967 after taking 74 wickets at just 21 runs apiece. Oh, yeah. uh, a fantastic performance. And uh, we, uh, we were very proud to say farewell to Michael Hogan at the end of this current season after taking 45 wickets during the year but you had taken almost double. So we'll talk again, uh, Tony, in a bit more detail about your rise into the Glamorgan team as a partner with the great Malcolm Nash. And mentioning yes. Malcolm Nash, here you are in the Glamorgan team of 1968. This is a photograph taken at Lords, and we can see alongside you in the back row, we can see the great Majid Khan, we can also see in the back row Alan Jones, so two of the finest uh, batters that Glamorgan have produced. In the front row as well, a great, uh, a very august selection there of Glamorgan cricketers, Alan Rees, Don Shepherd, Tony Lewis, Peter Walker and yes, Jones. Jeff Jones. So we'll again talk a little bit later on, and I mustn't leave out of this as well, on the far left in the back row, the great Ivy and Jones, who was one of the greatest wicketkeepers, and I'm sure we'll talk about 
a little bit later some of the many fine catches that he took off your bowling. Here you are at Sophia Gardens in 1967, bowling against Leicestershire. Uh, Glamorgan, of course, in your early days were playing at Cardiff Arms Park, but in 1966 that all ended, and from 1967 onwards you were playing at Sophia Gardens. I'm sure we'll talk about the ridge and some of the other features of the Sophia Gardens ground, and uh, of course, a place where you also tasted much success as well with uh, Cardiff Cricket Club, especially in the Western League in your later years. Now, there, there is a prize, uh, which I'm glad to say Tony did win. We did go through these photos a few minutes ago. There is a prize for anyone who recognises this pavilion. It is Colwyn Bay. This is Colwyn Bay 1966, during yeah. Glamorgan's game against Derbyshire. But if yeah. we roll forward to 1969, Glamorgan's game against Leicestershire in their championship winning year, Tony took career best figures of nine for 49. He came on a seventh change. I'm sure there's a great story there, which we'll be looking forward to hear. Well, into the 1970s, you became very adept uh, in terms of one day cricket as well. And of course, you were part of the Glamorgan team, winning the county championship there in 1969. And this Glamorgan team then tasted success, not only winning in uh, the championship in 1969, then ending up in second place in the county championship in 1970. And then several of the people in this photo then enjoying great success, including yourself, in one day cricket. The Gillette Cup final in 1977, very appropriately in your benefit year. And here we can see the Glamorgan team, different set of names, but Nash and Cordell there uh, as a very potent bowling force. We move on to your benefit year, a lovely car. I'm sure you can tell us what you did with it or whether you had to give it back, I don't know. But there you are enjoying like all good professionals in, the, in those days when you played. Huh? Recognition, you had your county cap in uh, 1967. So 10 years on, only right and proper, you had a benefit year. And we'll hear about uh, how the Glamorgan faithful were able to support you in that. And then you then, in your final years with Glamorgan, you become the county or the assistant county coach. Help with uh, Kevin Lyons, and in your last few years, as I say before, migrating to Canada, there you are helping to develop the next generation. So there's a very quick whistle-stop tour through your, um, through your uh, career. So, um, Tony, if I could ask you, first of all, then, um, yeah. if we go back to the uh, beginning, if we go back to uh, Bridgetown Barbados, September 1940. So, what are your what are your early memories of uh, playing cricket? Well, I um, as a as a young boy in, in Barbados, we um, I really wasn't greatly that in, you know, didn't didn't think about playing cricket at all. I what we what people call cricket. I never played cricket. I played bat and ball, which meant that um, anything in the shape of a cricket bat um, and a, a tennis ball. Cricket was something that I learned. I saw cricket being played in Barbados. With um, I watched a couple of days test matches and the, the games where Barbados played Jamaica and Trinidad. I think they call it the intercolonial cup or something like that that was cricket i saw england in a test match in barbados that was cricket but what i played was bat and ball because it you didn't need um kids just went out and organized a game and i will bat and you will ball and people will join and that's how we played all my cricket 
I learned all my cricket in Cardiff. That's where my education as far as cricket is concerned. Um, coming to Cardiff and uh, joining the Cardiff Cricket Club, um, going to the indoor school or indoor nets on a Monday evening in the, the North Stand at the Amspa. And I remember meeting Wyndham Lewis and a couple of the, the Cardiff, Cardiff all the, all the guys, Jack Evans and people from way back then. And my, my cricket education started in Cardiff. First Come time on. I ever, I first time I ever bowled in a pair of cricket boots was in Cardiff. Can I just take you back though to the West Indies? Mm -hmm. Am I right in thinking that there was a man called Frank King? Who yes, was your half-brother? My father's son, my half-brother, yes. Yeah. And I gather he was a decent cricketer. He, he was indeed. He was indeed a very decent cricketer, yeah. Played, and was he? Um, I think he represented um, both Barbados and the West Indies. Yeah. And your father was a decent cricketer? Well, he, um, yeah, he played cricket. He ran the, he ran the, the local cricket club. He was uh, a type of Wilford Woolley, if you like. <laughs> He was captain, he was in charge of everything. And the way we prepared um, our cricket pitch for the weekend, we, we carried um, sort of buckets of water out to the, out to the square and we, um, we, we watered the, uh, the square. And um, this would start on a Thursday evening after practice. And someone was then, uh, it was someone's job to go around somewhere where they would find the cuttings of a lawn or a cricket field somewhere and bring the grass back and we'll sprinkle that on this sort of wet strip and then rolled it and rolled it and rolled it. And that happened, um, that happened on Thursday evenings. And then we would continue to, to roll and wet the strip on Fridays. We put a sort of rope around it that people didn't sort of step over the rope. And this was sacred. This was a strip with sacred turf. So we looked after it and we did again on Friday. And then on Saturday, the game was played on a Saturday and then there would be a friendly game on a Sunday on the same pitch. And then there would be practice on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. And then we'd start the whole process again. So um, that's where I, I learned about cricket pitches and the, the, the boundaries and the one or two rules about the game of cricket but I never played in a sort of order, organized game of cricket where you, you know, you had umpires and you, you wore pads or things like that. I was um, yeah, much, too busy, I, much too busy growing up and having fun as a young kid. Absolutely. And, and I, I've been uh, to the Caribbean on several occasions. And I know when I went round Barbados and again, Antigua and St. Lucia recently, uh, not too recently, but pre-COVID. And I, I know on going around the islands, you just go through any village and any any open uh, plot of land, there might be a basketball court in one corner, but it's a cricket pitch and everyone playing spontaneous games and everyone playing with a smile on their face. Absolutely. And uh, wow, what a great, great talent. Um, obviously, Tony, you had a you had an important decision to make when you were 21. And I know your brother, your older brother, Steve, had already been part of the first, uh, if, if I could say the Windrush generation. Yeah. I, know your, I know your older brother, Steve, had, had decided to uh, come to England. And uh, you yourself then had that big decision to make. So talk us through that. Well, um, I remember I... I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to see some other place besides Barbados, and the whole emigration thing had opened up, and people were leaving from all parts of the West Indies and going up to England, and I thought, well, why not? A, a very good friend of mine, we we were we we just said, hey, let's let's have a go at this sort of thing. So we went down and we registered and um, they said to me, uh, in, in 10 days, I, I got a passport. I got all the um, tests for whatever they were testing you for at the time. 
and we jumped onto a plane and, and went off went off to London. And when I got when I got to London, I had the shock of my life. This was in January of 19, where were we 61? I I had never experienced cold or even though we were a group together, it, it felt really very, very lonely. And I thought to myself, now, what have I done? You know, get me back on that plane and get me back to Barbados. And then um, I, I came over to work with London Transport in, um, and it didn't, um, after the first couple of days, I, I, I really didn't like what I was experiencing. And lucky enough for me, I had siblings in, in Cardiff and um, I got in touch with them. In those days, you can put a letter in a letter box. You, you remember those little red things called letter yeah, box? Yeah, 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 they're still around. And if you got if you got, if you got that into the letter box before five o'clock in the evening, tea time, the person, no matter what part of England it was, or even Ireland and Scotland, they would receive it the next day. So I put this this letter in the in the letter box, um, and off it went. And then on a Sunday, probably about four or five days later, there was a knock on the door where I was living in. Um, I think it would have been Forest Gate. It was a knock on the door, and there was my sister and my brother's wife, Steve's wife. And, you know, she introduced herself and it was good, lovely to see, you know, family. And she said, you're coming with us. I said, well, I can't do that. She said, you're coming, to, coming with us. Just leave the uniform. Tell someone to tell your boss at London Transport that you've gone. And I was on my way to Cardiff on that Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, as you would say. And... Um you got a job initially with British Rail in the Canton Depot as a shunter, is that right? Um, yes, I was, um, let me see. I was, I was sort of station, station in Pengam. Yeah. That was what I, I uh, that's, but yeah, you would, in those days, they would um, sort of swap you around the yard so you get used to, all the yards and the, there was Pengam and and uh, in Canton, and um, yeah, and that's where I started. But what happened is that when I went um, after a couple of days in in Cardiff, my my sister in law Peggy she took me up to the Westgate Street Labour Exchange, which is right next to the Arms Park at the time. Yeah, and um, I went up, um, sort of registered, and while waiting to be interviewed. I actually looked out the window and I saw this cricket ground. Well, I guess it was a cricket ground because it was an idle scoreboard. This is in January. Yeah, yeah. The idle scoreboard there and the, the, the ground, the grass, the field was beautiful, beautifully green. I mean, in, in January, every cricket ground is like, it's really beautiful. And I, I stood there for a couple of minutes and I started to dream, not of playing county cricket or test cricket or anything. I just dreamt of playing cricket on a field like that. And after I, um, after I got the job, I came out of the um, exchange and instead of turning left, going to the arms bar, I turned right and um, went into the, the, the country club. Yeah. Westgate Street, and I, I walked in and the, the lady at the reception and she was really very kind because I, I don't think in those days someone like me could actually go into the, the county club. And she put me right and said, well, you should go into the, the ground on the left-hand side of the exchange. And I went in and went into the Cardiff office at the time, spoke to the receptionist there, and she in turn phone Wyndham Lewis and we had a chat and um, he told me about the um, the indoor school on Monday evenings with Don Ward, ex yeah. Morgan. And I went in, went in that evening about six o'clock, 5.30, six o'clock. And that was the first time I was ever shown how to hold a cricket ball, you know? Yeah. 
in no terms one. of the same in terms of the same position. Absolutely. Yeah? No one had ever told me how to to stand at a wicket or bowl a cricket ball to swing it this way or to seam it that way. But anyway, I went in and from a couple of those early photos that you saw there, I was I looked a pretty awesome person. I, I looked a little bit like Wes Hall at the time. And and I just ran in and the I don't know the, the kids or the guys who was there. It was it was just frightening. And there was a little bit of a, a lull and, and Don Ward said to me, um, would you like to bat? And I said, yes. And the same thing happened while I was batting because to me, a cricket ball was there to be smacked and you smacked it as hard as you could. And um, from then on, then um, I, I played, joined the Carlton Cricket Club and I think the first game I played was on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was a club called West Bisco. Heard, heard that club? Yeah, yeah, and Cumbrian Brown, Biscuit Manufacturers. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I ran in, and the very first ball I bowled, I, I missed my run up and I kept going and I <laughs> bowled it off the wrong foot. And no. the best batsman, his stumps just went flying. And I think the, the impression that, um, that the Cardiff cricketers had on that day, I remember. David Lewis saying, oh, it's another Nick Edwards, because Nick Edwards bowled off the wrong foot. Yeah, yeah. Right? But um, I remember on that Sunday that um, Ozzy Wheatley was a guest of Cardiff Cricket Club at the time. And I, I, think, I think what was going on there was um, a deal was being struck between Wyndham Lewis and Ozzy Wheatley. If you get this guy into the county, you can marry Christine. <laughs> you remember Christine was the lady. I, was the lady I do time. remember Christine Wheatley. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. But of course, we we mustn't forget Tony that the early nineteen sixties that we're we're talking about were the years when quite a few counties started to have overseas uh, professionals. I'm thinking of Carlton Forbes at Nottinghamshire. Obviously, yes. Gary Sobers in in later years, um, and obviously, I know that um, Glamorgan, following the retirement of uh, Wilf Wooler, and ob obviously Ozzy taking over, looking for um, a spearhead to the attack, and to have a a nasty fast bowler, a nasty fasty, uh, it must have been manna from from heaven. Now, I, am I right in thinking that you had a um, your first year with Cardiff Cricket Club, you 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 set quite a few records there with your wicket taking, and yeah. I gather that you you managed to hit the ball a long way off. And of course, batting at the Arms Park in those days, the ball clanging up against the uh, the North Stand with the uh, with the metalwork there. Wow, have you got I... memories of that, or did you did you manage to hit any over the Westgate Street flats? No, 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 no. I, I, I have memories of bowling, uh, playing. I had memories of enjoying cricket. And the, the fact with Cardiff, it was, um, you, you didn't, you probably had one all rounder and that was Alan Friday. Right? Yeah. But you, you bowl or you batted. And um, the occasion for me to go in and smack the ball around on a on a on a Saturday afternoon wasn't wasn't there because we had a pretty pretty strong side at the time and um along with Peter Gatehouse he he opened the bowling he and I shared the new ball we opened the attack and then I think David David Lewis was our leg spinner. Yeah so, yeah uh, uh and then there were the 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 Sunday team and you didn't very often get people who played in the team on Saturday playing on Sundays. I mean, the, the Sunday team was run by people like, was captained by people like Gordon Eccles and, oh. and that, that type of, that, that, those guys. But yeah. we, the, the whole thing about Cardiff Cricket Club was so great because the, the, the thing that sits, um, sits with me is at the end of a Saturday evening, you go in, you go upstairs in the lounge, and you sit with people like Jack Evans, David Herbert Sr., 
Um, you would see Gordon Richard once in a while. He would pop in and pop out. And um, Norman Richards, the, the, the stories that those guys told, and you listen to them, uh, that was all part of um, my, my learning. Um, Glamorgan was... The Morgan was way after uh, way after Cardiff, and what I learned in Cardiff was the beginning of what happened on the field um, for the Morgan. Yeah. Now, I think I'm right in thinking that you made your Glamorgan second team debut against Warwickshire second eleven. Was it at Ebu Vale? It was at Ebu Vale. It was at, at Abbeville, yes. And um, on that occasion, it rained and not much was played. I don't know why anybody ever think you can play a game uh, more than one day at Abbeville because Abbeville, you know, was in that the ground was like at the bottom of, of a valley. And then a cloud would come over Abbeville and it would happen to just sit over the cricket ground. And it was dark and it would start to drizzle and um, you didn't play much cricket there. But um, in that game, I remember meeting um, Billy Abadella. Remember yeah. him? Yeah. Billy Abadella and um, Rudy Webster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Rudy Webster, yeah. Rudy went on to be part of the um, Kerry Parker sort of group. Yeah. So along with along with Kelton Forbes, it was Rudy Webster and Biddy Abadella. And there was another guy from Hampshire. They were the only, they were the only um, sort of people of color, we say, or people from overseas who were playing cricket in, um, in the counties in those days. Was that Roy Marshall? No. No, well, Roy Marshall was a white guy. The, no, no, the other I, guy I, was, I, sorry, the other guy I was the... from, from Antigua. Um, I can't remember yeah. his name now. Um, yeah. Now, you said earlier on that you had your first proper coaching with um, with Glamorgan. I guess Phil Clift must have played a major role. That's right. In those in those days, we just had Phil Cliff was the coach, and he was, if you like, the mentor because he looked after the the Colts and the second team, and. He was the only coach we had. And I think you you probably go back to maybe Jeff Jones and Alan Jones, who were there before me. Phil Cliff was their coach. And the other person would Wilfred Willow. And they were the only, they were the only coaches we knew. And then once Phil prepared you and got you into the first team, and you were then looked after by the captain. But in those days, people like Tony Lewis and Don Shepard, Ozzy Wheatley, they never did any coaching. You were given into the first team, you bowl or you bat it or you feel at this place or that place, and you had to do it out in the middle. The, there was no, um, the only person who did any bit of coaching was Peter Walker with his catching. And he did that with people who failed it close to the wicket. Billy Slade and Roger Davis and people like that. But you were left on your own. I mean, if, if I could fast forward, or if I can take what is going on now, whether it's a good thing or not, with all these different coaches that you have. I mean, the first real professional coach that we had in Glamorgan, or out and out coach, was Tom Cartwright. And yeah. he came to us, I think in 1977, as a player coach. And Tom had played at Warwickshire. I don't know. If, I don't think he was a coach at Warwickshire. I think he went to Somerset as a type of player coach, and yeah. then he came to Glamorgan then as a full coach player. And that was the first person that we had in the dressing room. This is 1977, 15 years later. Where yeah, we must we mustn't forget um, someone who I saw this afternoon actually who sends his best wishes to you, Kevin Lyons, I hope to bump into. Yes, uh, yes. In, in Pont Cana. And uh, of course, Kevin decided in the early, uh, in the early 1970s to uh, retire from, uh, or sorry, to switch from being a player to a second team captain and coach. 
he still yeah. played a little bit of first team, I know. But yes. um, you're quite right. The uh, Tom joined us in 1977, very much initially as um, as a player manager. Uh, and uh, the um, you're you're right in what you say. Can I just ask you there about Wilf Wooler? How how um, what was your relationship with Wilf? Well, we, Wilf and I, Wilf and I had a very, very, very good relationship. We, um, it's the same I can, I can say with people like um, Alan Jones, Adrian Jones, Jeff Jones, um, all the guys going back to Iris Lewis and Billy Slade. We had a great, we had a great relationship with them because we respected him greatly and we listened to him. And as I said, Phil was our coach. And if there was anything extra, well, it didn't have to be extra. But well, when Wilf was around, he would spend time telling, talking to everybody. And he occasionally captained the second 11. So our relationship was very good and um, great respect for the man. I mean, we, we heard all kinds of stories about Wilf. And, you know, the, the biggest one, they said, and I think it was because he probably um, he probably voiced his opinion about sport in South Africa and things like that and everybody thought that he was a racist because they thought he was in favour of a party but I, I never found that I never found that at all and if he was why would he sign me mm. a black man first black man ever to play for the Morgan why would he sign a black man to play for Glamorgan? So I, I, I had great respect for the man. And um, I, I am part of a group of ex-players called the Razors. And this was founded by Pat Pocock. And yeah. every, every day we get an email wishing various people a happy birthday and things like that. And, about two, three weeks ago, it was Will's birthday. Mm. And he came up and everybody wished him happy birthday. And it was one or two people told uh, a story that they had heard about Wilf. And Alan Wilkins, he wrote a very good, um, he posted a very good letter about, about Wilf and advising people that they should read a book that was apparently written by, published by Les Spence. Mm. And um, and they they talked about Wilf, but a lot of people, a lot of people had a lot of respect for the man. You know, he, mm. in my opinion, was a great man. Well, let's go back to your early years in 1963 and 1964. We'll talk we'll talk about the Australians in a minute and the victory, the great victory at Swansea. But I gather um, you actually acquired your nickname um around that time and if my sources are correct and this is Gwyn Hughes and I Ross Lewis who've uh, told me this that there was a second team game a second team game at Leicester I think it was that's right where people went into the cinema yes. and there was um there were the cartoons as of course in the old days and and there was the uh, the cartoon character speedy gonzalez yes. running around yes and i don't know whether it was i ross or whether it was gwyn turned to you and said something about how fast this person was running and throwing a ball yeah and that's how your nickname of speedy i gather um stuck is that is that true that is true we went to um we went up to leicester to play second 11 game and um it we, we arrived at the ground, it was a Wednesday, because in those days we played second 11 games, Wednesdays and Thursdays, um, because the county game finished on Tuesday, and there was another game started on Saturday, so you traveled on Friday. And we went to play, we turned up on a Wednesday morning, it was drizzly, and it was one of those games, one of those days where it was a little too wet or too miserable to start the game. So um, we didn't start on time and then the umpires had a look and then they said, oh, we'll have lunch early and then we'll have a look after lunch. So we had lunch early and um, probably about 12.30. 
And after lunch, the umpire said, well, we're not going to play today. We'll call it off. So it was, <laughs> it was really too early to go back and go to the local pub or the, the, the bar and play darts and, and whatever, play darts and have a few halves. And uh, we decided, hey, let's go to the cinema. So off we went to the cinema, went in, sat down, lights went down, you know, screened it. And it was um, Looney Tunes was a character. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, beep, beep, what's up, Doc? You know, that sort of thing. And then out came this character, um, rather large sombrero, uh, a mustache, which went all the way, very dark mustache, went all the way down to, you could use it as a thigh pad. Mm. And um, straight away, Quinn, because, because he was brown, I, I suppose he was Mexican, he was brown in color. And straight away, Gwyn Hughes turned to me, who was sitting next to me, and said, his name is Speedy Gonzalez. And Gwyn said, Speedy! You know, so I went into the cinema as Tony Corlo came out in, came out of Speedy, and it's been that ever since then. So um, I, I don't know if people, I'm, I'm still called Speedy to this day in, in cricket. I mean, this was all over the world, if you like. Everybody knew me as Speedy, but I don't know if they really knew how I came about that nickname. So there you are, well, Speedy. I know, I know that uh, if you have a nickname, well, it's it means you're one of the boys you've made it and oh, yeah. oh, uh, all yeah. the rest of it so oh, let's yeah. move on let's move on tony or perhaps i should call you speedy, speedy yeah. <laughs> let's okay. let's move on to 1964 here you are as a a novice county player someone yeah. who's still learning the ropes as yeah. it were together with quite a few other youngsters it must be yeah. said to be thrown in in august against the Australians at Swansea, Bobby Simpson and all the others who were who were absolutely slaughtering England in the Test yeah. Series. What was it like for you to be part of the 64 team, the 64 well, Glamorgan well, team, it was, um, to it, win? I, I, I don't know. It was, um, it, it wasn't, I, it was, it was strange. It was strange because I was just learning about learn about the, the game of cricket and how to how to be a professional and, and things like that. I remember we were playing a game, maybe a chance for the next in Essex. And we came off the field and Ozzy Wheatley jokingly said, you know, he 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 would say things and then had that laugh, you know. <laughs> and he said, well let's go home and we'll beat the Australians. That's what he said on a Friday. So we pitched up on the Saturday and, you know, all these names, uh, Ian Redpath and Barry German, Bob Simpson, like, you know, I'm like, what chance do we have? But we had, um, we had two guys, um, Don Shepard, Jim Pricey, Peter Walker, um, Ozzy. I, I probably bowled about three or four overs the whole game. And just did my bit running around in the field and you know that sort of thing. And it was um beating the Australians. Well, that was <laughs> that was something that I never thought would happen. And the celebrations afterwards, lots of singing. Did you did you join oh, in with the singing? Absolutely. One of the great things about the, the Welsh people, they're singing. And not only singing, but they sing in harmony. They sing the right tunes. And when I arrived at Glamorgan, um, David Evans, he used to lead, he used to lead the world singing, you know, and, and uh, he and Alan Jones, they could, they could carry a tune and, and it, it was really great. So if it rained, we would be, there would be in a dressing room singing and you know all the Welsh, all the Welsh songs. I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand a word, but I knew one of the songs that they was very popular. I heard it being sung at the Answer during a game of rugby, and the, the English words to "Feed me till I want won't no more," you know, and or "Feed me now and evermore." But the the rugby song was "Feed me till I want no more." 
And then um, I started off, Don Shepherd asked me to sing, hey, do you know um, Island in the Sun, a Jamaica Farewell and Banana Boat Song? So they would sing a couple of well songs and then I would teach them Banana Boat Song and Jamaica Farewell. So the whole thing was um, a, a dressing room of song. So uh, that was from great. bread of from bread of heaven um, to uh, the calypsos, etc. Let's just talk briefly about the winter months. Am I right in thinking you played a little bit of football for uh, the team in Grange Town? Grange Twins, yes. Grange Twins during the um, during the, the summer during the winter months. I uh, you know I being as they call this then I I don't know they. I know, sportsman, athlete, whatever at the time. And I think some of the guys from the West played rugby. Well, you know that Alan, not Alan, Alan Reese, he yeah. was playing, he was playing rugby. Um, I think Ivy and Jones played rugby in the West. And we we just didn't stick around and we 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 did things. So I I knocked around with the guys in Green Screens. Uh, I played played football. Yeah. What? What position, Speedy? Well, was only there is only one position in football in those days. You had to be a striker, and then then in the later years, everything was midfield. So even at the school where I was coaching cricket and soccer, you uh, 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 you asked one of the boys, one of the kids, well, what position do you want to play? And everything was midfield, and I said. Well, you know, midfield is not somewhere where you stand and don't move. Midfielders run back and they run forward, but everybody wanted to be a midfield player because they thought that was where everything happened. So that Brilliant. was one place to play, and that was striker up front, score the goals. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, let's move on to 1966, because in the summer of 1966, the West Indies were touring and yeah. you played against them at Swansea when Alan Jones, I think, uh, scored a brilliant uh, innings against them, Wes Hall running in. Um, and how did you feel to see some of your boyhood heroes uh, in and actually to take part against them? Well, I... <laughs> The first West Indies tour that I was um, sort of involved with 19, would be 1963. Yeah. And I was told that Ozzy Wheatley may have had an injury. And I was to stand by to play at the Arms Park in 63 in case Ozzy failed the fitness test. Ozzy, Ozzy came into the dressing room on that Saturday morning. Um, and I saw, I saw something which looked to me like a rainbow ankle. It was, it was huge, and it was an ankle of many colors. It was badly bruised. Mm -hmm. And he took out the old pink crepe bandage, and he just strapped it up and said he was fit. He didn't go out to bowl the ball to see whether his ankle was okay or not. He just said he was fit. And I remember now him sitting um, in the change room on the seat and strapping up this ankle. And um, I was due to play for Cardiff that Saturday afternoon. So Ozzy declared himself fit. And I'm in the Cardiff team. We're going, we're going down west to play somebody somewhere. But before we left, I remember watching a couple overs at at the arms bar. And when I saw, I saw Wes Hall walk back to the picket fence mm. and there was, there were all the West Indians there and they were howling. And, and Wes Hall ran in, I think he bowled the first ball to Alwyn Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the ball was in, I think David Murray, David Murray. Derek Murray. Derek Murray. The ball was in Derek Murray's gloves before Alvin Harris would play the ball, I thought, <laughs> and also, before he played the shot, and I thought, Ozzy, what a 
brilliant idea to declare yourself fit because I wouldn't have fancied facing that sort of stuff. So off we went. But then if we move forward to 1966, um, it was, I, 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 yeah, I was in, I, I played a little bit in 1965 and, you know, I was just beginning to get the hang of playing cricket almost every day. And this was an exciting moment for me. And I, I think coming up to that, you, you probably thinking in terms of Convert Hunt being dismissed who bagged mm. the pair for the first time in his career. Yeah, yeah. yeah? And I, I, I got him both times. First innings, he was caught by Ivy and Jones behind the wicket. And the second innings, he was caught in gully by, by Roger Davis. So that was um to me, that was awesome to get to get someone like that and him bagging his first pair ever in first class cricket and being out to me because Conrad Chant was a, a Bajan boy just like myself. Yeah, you've just you've just mentioned there Roger Davis. You also mentioned Ivy and Jones. Um two of the finest fielders, I think Glamour, well. Obviously, Peter Walker would, uh, we, we, we mustn't forget him. But Roger, standing yeah. bravely at short leg, and I can remember as a young boy yeah. watching Ivy and behind the stumps. Yeah. And I know it was said, Ivy and, Ivy and never dropped a chance. Um, for you as a bowler, what yeah. did it mean for you as a bowler to have such outstanding fielders like Peter Walker, like Roger Davis, and I even behind the stumps. Well, it was um, for me. For, for I, I, um, I made my debut. I got the. I played against Cambridge University of Margam in 1963. And um, the the wicket, my first first class wicket, was um, Tony Windows caught by Ivian behind the stumps. And for some reason or other, I always felt as long as Ivian Jones was behind the stumps that I would get a wicket. I always felt that a batsman would nick one, you know? And um, Roger Davis, I remember 1969, playing at Cardiff against um, Gloucester. I think Roger was feeling a back pad for me in that game. And uh, again, I, I came on to bowl. I think Malcolm had bowl and Lawrence had bowl and Don Shepard a ball, and then I was throwing the ball. And I, I think I picked up six wickets for about 21 runs in 14 overs or something. And if I'm right in think uh, a couple of those catches were taken at short leg by Roger. It was just like sort of bat, pad, and all of a, all of a sudden, there's these two hands as if they were, as if he was moving forward. And, and took two, two brilliant close to wicket catches for me. And um, I, the, those, those are guys that I, I grew up with, you know, Roger and Ivian, and always love, love having those guys when we play together in the seconds or in the first team, always great having those guys around. Now 19, at the end of the 1966 season, Ozzy Wheatley went into semi-retirement, handed over the Glamorgan captaincy for 1967 to Tony Lewis. And, of course, Ozzy, having spearheaded the Glamorgan attack, taking the new ball with the likes of Jeff Jones, etc. Um, now there's an opportunity for you. And, of course, Malcolm Nash, in the summer of 1966, had, yeah. had also uh, burst onto the scene. So let's just talk about um, let's just talk about your memories of bowling with Jeff, and also your memories of bowling with Nashi. Um, well, with Jeff, Jeff at the time was um, up and coming. They were talking about him being, you know, the hopes of him playing for for England. He was very very quick, and 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 to me it was. It, it wasn't even a dream. I, I mean, I was, I was just out there playing um, your name in the team and I went out and played. And I, I suppose 
I, I thought that cricket was a sport to be enjoyed because I, I never grew up thinking, oh, I'm going to play cricket. And, you know, today kids are in the kids are in the uh, in the nets and they go to the great the, the various places for practice and coaching. I never thought that cricket actually playing cricket was um, it wasn't even a dream. So it is something that was happening. I was learning all the time and then um, accepting the, the, the responsibility that was placed on me and I would do the best that I could. So it was never, um, it was never that I am, I am the, the other end of Jeff Jones. He bowled and we admired him and it was talk about him. And when I was given the ball, I just went up and I, Listen to what I was told by Phil Clift and by Wilfred Wooler, and I tried it, and it 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 came off. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. But um, to me, it was I I I, I never even thought of it as a job. Mm. If you, I know when I uh, I started watching Glamorgan, to have the opening partnership of Nash and Cordell, you were so complimentary Nashi as a left armor with his swing away and his swing back in and then you as a quite a skiddy uh bowler um uh what what was the what did tony what did they are you know what was your what was your plan well uh, <laughs> my plan again especially at that time because I think I had become then a, an established or, or more nearly an established bowler in the Morgan attack. And um, again, I was, I was learning all the time and I was going into the nets and practicing and practicing and then going out in the middle and trying to put what I, what I practice and make it, make it perfect. And it, it started to happen. And um, I, I always knew that um, there was a difference between Malcolm and myself because he was left arm and he swung it in, he swung it away. And I, I did a little bit off the seam and things like that. And it, it, it was working okay. And I, I, was pretty, I was pretty happy the way things were going. Well, because obviously 1967 also saw Glamorgan move from the arms path to Sophia Gardens. Now, much has been written about the pitch in those early days at Sophia Gardens. Uh, stories about the drains not being put in correctly. Did the engineers have their bits of paper, the map uh, turn the wrong way round? And uh, I do know that there was a little bit of a ridge and there was another West Indian bowler called Gregory Armstrong who seemed to uh, uh, repeatedly find that in the mid 1970s but for you uh, speedy moving to cardiff in uh moving to sophia gardens i should say in 1967 1968 what was it like in those early years bowling having left behind the arms park right in the heart of the city center and moving to much more of a parkland pitch well um i, I think a lot was said a lot was written about the um, about the Sapphire Gardens pitch and the, the drain and things like that. Uh, a lot of things were written by people or said by people who were just like me, who had no idea of how you prepare a pitch, how you set up a pitch or anything. Uh, I think it, it was said that um, when it rained, when it rained, the ground would hold a lot of water. Well. It, it makes sense that it would hold a lot of water because just behind the boundary, behind that little pavilion at the back was, was, a, was a huge river. So it's obvious that when it rained, that the, the water would, would, the, would come to the surface. And the idea of putting nets so close to the river was, was hilarious because the wets were always damp. And if it rained, and if the river came up, you couldn't play. But then um, I remember the, the groundsman, his name was Richard, can't remember the other name. Stevens. He, he just dug this huge trench 
across the square, not from, would it be, not east-west, but north-south. And it went right across the square. And after filling, putting the drainage in and, and filling it up again, it, it sort of, the level just, it, it just began to settle. So it just left this, um, this sort of like a gutter and you had a ridge either side. But the, the thing is that if you hit one side of the ridge, the ball would go over the top. And if you hit the other side of the ridge, it just creep along the ground. And in the middle of that ridge was always some, some kind of grass in there because the mower can get into the ridge, into the, into the gutter or the gully to cut the grass out. But it was, um, it was such, it was placed in such a way it was right across the middle of the pitch. And to hit it, you would have to persistently bowl very short. And that is something that Gregory Armstrong had no problem with at all. Everything, you very, very rarely got anything up in your half where you can actually come on the front foot. And he was very, very quick. And the great thing about it is that he, he didn't know where it was going. So how you as a batsman had any idea when it was coming, right? When he let yeah. it go, he had no idea. So he kept you guessing. And it was, it was pretty dangerous. Well, in 1967, going back to that season, you picked up 74 wickets at 21 runs apiece. You were awarded your Glamorgan County cap. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Speedy, but you were presented with your cap at Western Supermare in the match against Somerset together with Ivy and Jones. With, with Ivy and Jones, we had a we had another we had another good day, Ivy and I, and we were both awarded our, our county caps on a Saturday evening. I remember we were all sat together in the bar or in the in the hotel lounge and I I didn't know anything about it. Ivan didn't know anything about it. And funny enough, we, we were all sat in the lounge. Every member of the team were there when um Tony Lewis said guys just a minute I have an announcement to make and I am awarding County Caps to Tony Cole and Ivy and Jones, congratulations, guys. <laughs> Both Ivy and I had to buy a round of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and but there's a the, oh there's a there's a oh there's a story. It's, there's something that happened to me just before that game, which I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you on camera. Okay. I, I can, I can, I can phone you, or you can phone me, <laughs> and I can tell you. Yeah, I can tell you a story. It was, um, it was a, it was a bad one. Okay. I cannot, well, I, I cannot go on camera and tell you that story. Okay. Well, I look forward to speaking to you off camera yeah. uh, and hearing yes, that. But I know that all your, all your hard work, um, paid off, because yeah. in 19, 1968, against Hampshire at Sophia Gardens, you took, well, you took 11, wick, 11 wickets in the match. Wow. Seven for 43 and four for 24. And you got the great South African batter, Barry Richards out <laughs> in <laughs> both innings. Now, was that your, was that, do you think your finest moment in a Glamorgan shirt in terms of bowling? Um, was the drain still there? <laughs> it, well, did, did, did I don't know, but look at, if you look in the, the scorebook, both times Barry Richards, South African great, dismissed yeah. by Tony Cordell. Was it? Oh, wow. Well, that is something to remember. But um, I, I don't exactly remember that. I remember getting the, I remember getting the 7 for 43 because that was my best bowling figures. Uh, to date, but um, Barry Barry was a, 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 a nice guy, great guy. It's amazing that he, he would have a conversation with you or he would have a conversation with me during the innings and you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have many batsmen 
speaking freely to the opposition while he's um, actually playing his trade. And, you know, at the end of, at the, end of the over, he'd probably say, wed ball or, or something like that. And he was, a, he was a great player. I admired his batting greatly because you had to bowl, you had to, you had to bowl some good deliveries every ball to Barry Richards. You would, um, if it was the last ball of the over and he would face, you'd probably, you'd probably try and bowl it wide enough where he couldn't reach it because he would take a single and go down the other end and then take five of the next six balls. But um, I remember getting, I remember those figures, but um, the actual how it happened, I, I, I can't Yeah, well, I did, I did speak to your partner in crime, Malcolm Nash, about this game a few years ago when, uh, when Malcolm was preparing his, uh, his autobiography. Oh, yes. And he did say uh, that Barry regarded him as one of the finest opening bowlers, a very difficult swing bowler not sure whether which way it was you know was it coming in was it going straight on was it was it swinging away and uh nashi uh nashi which i think it was a compliment nashi said well he probably decided to uh throw the bat at speedy and uh and nicked off so uh that's uh that's a fine compliment let's also look at 1968 speedy because having been in the team in 64 that beat the australians you did the double in '68. What are your What are your memories of that game at Swansea? Well, my my memories of that game really is about. Um, uh, I think it was a guy called Paul Sheehan. Sheehan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Sheehan. He stood between us and beating the Australians, and he played superbly until he he hit one back to Peter Walker, which. I think Peter Peter's the only person on that day or in our team that would have taken that catch. And it was a cotton ball. And you know, he had he had scored. Did 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 Shane got it get a hundred or he was yeah, 100, 137. And I think Peter's sort of almost telescopic arms uh oh. uh clinging on. It was a catch that turned the match. Absolutely. Um, and there was a massive crowd there again. Oh yeah, yeah. And the singing, did you? Um, um, yeah, did we. They bread sang. Of, bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. They sang. They sang. They sang. And the Australians, the Australians loved the singing as well. And they, um, I think one of them sang "Tie Me Kangaroo Down" or something like that. I mean, it's. Uh, but I remember Barry Barry Jarman, who was captain. Yeah, he um, they asked him to say a few words upstairs in the pavilion, and he said, "Well, we lost to Glamorgan. What's new?" Yeah. And that sort of <laughs> brought the house down because the last time he was there, they had lost. Uh, they lost again to Glamorgan as well. But it was um, it was a great it was a great day. It was yeah, a let's days, as a matter of fact. And yeah, now obviously Tony Lewis wasn't able to captain the team that day. And uh, Don Shepherd was Glamorgan captain. Mm -hmm. Let's let's just spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about Don as a bowler and Don as a tactician. Yeah. What was it like playing alongside Don? It was it was sort of um, you know, give the ball to Don. Don is going to bowl, and and that's that's that that that's what it was. You um. Until until later on, I, I think 1969 or maybe if you go back to 68, that you'll see that um, uh, when when Lawrence Williams joined the team and he and Malcolm Nash would open the bowling and then um, Don Shepard would always come on for most most of the time. Don would come on as first change before I got the ball, so it was always a case of you know just take the shine off the ball and then then give it to Don Shepherd. He was such a great bowler. He 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 was he was something else. Just to just to move from mid off or the deep square leg or just behind square and just watch Don operate was was absolutely out of this world. 
and a wonderful, wonderful gentleman as well. Oh, great, um, he, yeah, he produced some remarkable figures. And of course, if we move on now to 1969, uh, during that year, Don took his 2000 first class wicket during the game against Worcestershire at Cardiff that clinched the county title. We'll come back to that match in a minute, but I just want to talk about some of the other personalities in uh, in that team because of course by then Glamorgan had acquired the services of two overseas players in Brian Davis and Majid Khan can yeah. you can you just share with us your memories of both Brian and Majid well Majid joined us in 1968 after um slogging Roger Davis I think it was <laughs> probably 30 in an over at Swansea, something like that. Yeah, five 19, sixes. Yeah. In 1960, 1967. That's right. And um, his, I think it was said that his father knew Wilfred Wooler. That's right. They were at Cambridge together. The can, um, yeah. They were at Cambridge together. And so uh, that's how, that's how Magic joined us. So we had, um, if you like, our, our number three and our middle order bat batting was shored up a little bit more. Um, so we had, we had some, we had, um, would it be Roger Davis and Alan Jones at the top? And then there would be Magic. But I, I think that Brian, Brian Davis came to us as an opening batsman. And uh, as all West Indians for, for some reason or other, even the great clown, even the great Viv Richards, always seemed to play across the front foot. I mean, Viv Richards, he hits so many things over mid-wicket that he played around his front foot. And so Brian Davis, having not a, like, not a lot of experience or no experience at all about the swinging ball, he would always find himself with a pad in the middle and he'd be given out LBW lots of times. And I think Wilf changed that. He had a word with Tony and he said, I think Brian would be better suited if he batted about number five, where the ball wasn't swinging anymore. He was brought up in Trinidad and um, on a wicket that turned more than you got pace from. And that strengthened that strengthened our, our middle order batting. And um, that that was tremendous. But Majid, Majid was, I suppose, uh, he was a character. You won't say he was a great character because he 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 wasn't he wasn't a Wilfred Wooler or somebody like that. But he the way he thought of cricket and especially bowlers, that he was always out to prove a point. We would talk about this bowler does this or this bowler does that. And he would actually say, well, I will get runs against this bowler or that bowler. And he'd go and he'd do it. You know, he was, um, he, he was, a, he was a, a great batsman too. Talking about another great batsman, great left-handed batter, Alan Jones, top of the order. Of course, um, the following year, 1970, Alan did play for England against the rest of the world in a game which at the time was called a test match and it had a test match attack and uh, the greatest, possibly one of the greatest bowling attacks of all time. But um, that, that honour or that status, I should say, of the game being called a uh, test match was taken away. But how... If you was a bowler, uh, Speedy, yeah. in terms of analysing Alan Jones's technique as an opening batter, um, how would you have bowled to him? Well, if you um, he he was technically as strong as Jeff Boycott, um, John Edrich. You bowl wicket to wicket, straight to those guys. And you get the ball, they would play the ball on his merits. 
And technically, he was very, very, very sound, as sound as any opening batsman in those days. I mean, today it's quite different. Today you go in and everybody's hitting the first ball for six if, if, if necessary or if possible, or they're actually trying to hit the first ball for six. But in those days, he was technically as sound as any of the others. And his record, obviously, 34,000 uh, first-class runs for Glamorgan speaks for itself. Let's just talk, before we look at your own performances in 69, let's just talk about Peter Walker as well. Um, batter, bowler, fielder, you could almost say the perfect all-rounder. Well, he, he was indeed. Um, I wish he wasn't... Um... If, let me, let me see, I want to be correct here. If Peter Walker was the type of person who his only occupation was actually playing the game of cricket, I think he would have played a lot more for England. Mm -hmm. But he, and you, you can't really blame him because he saw... He always wanted to be. He always wanted to be in sports. Peter carried a little, um, I don't know, uh, something a little bigger than a cassette recorder with him, and he would always, sometimes during the day or in the evening, find somebody a name in in sports, the opposition, or someone like that, a Tom Graveney or. Uh, 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 Colin Cowdery, Fred Titmus, these people. And he would always have a, a quiet 10, 15 minutes with them, interviewing and recording. And then he would, I, I suppose he would sell that to the BBC or something like that. So he always wanted to get into um, broadcasting and sports broadcasting. Um, but if if he if he was an out and out cricketer, someone like Alan Jones, you know, he would have been he would have represented England many more times than he did. And as you said, a perfect all rounder could could bulk turn his arm to bowling. You both seam up, or you'll try and do a bit of left arm spin. Good middle order batsman, great close to wicket fielder. I mean, like he, <laughs> we used to say he could catch a fly or something like that. You know. Mm. Great, but he he wanted to get into broadcasting, and uh, I, I think cricket was just a way of trying to do that. But you know, he 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 was a great great cricketer, another great cricketer, great man to learn from. Yeah, and all, would always give his time to uh, young up and coming uh, players, always prepared yes. to share. Yes. Um, yes. yes, I know that can't that can't be said about every cricketer. But uh, he was always prepared to uh, pass things on. Let's talk yeah. about 1969, Speedy. Let's talk about Colwyn Bay. Oh, dear. <laughs> Let's talk about that game against Leicestershire. You ended up with figures of nine for 49. How come you were seven to change that day? Well, that is something that you would have to ask. Something you would have to ask the captain. Um, I, I, I think... If I'm, uh, there's another story to that. I mean, I, I think the game before that at Sophia Gardens, we'd just beaten, we'd just beaten Gloucester. And in that game, I, I had a spell, I think, in the first innings of six, taking six for 21 and helping us to beat Gloucester. I might have, might have had seven or eight wickets in the game. And again, in the first innings, I was the fourth person to bowl. And uh, we were going off to Colwyn Bay. And something happened where Malcolm Nash and Lawrence Williams, they arrived at the ground on the Friday morning late. And um, Ozzy had come to the ground on a Wednesday and Thursday and he'd taken a box or two balls up to the nets and he spent about an hour up there 
bowling, bowling, bowling. So you can see that he was more or less gonna be in the, the party going to Colin Bay. And as it happened, because what happened to Lawrence and Malcolm, they were both sort of say punished or reprimanded because they arrived at the ground late. One would go to Colwood Bay, and I think the other would join us the next game, maybe at Worcestershire, where Aussie was not available for that midweek game. So it happened that I, I, I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll get a chance to open the bowling with Aussie. But it, it, it didn't happen. If you, if you look down the scorecard, I mean, Aussie bowled and Don Shepherd bowled. Majid Bowl and and I kept going from mid off to finally, and it didn't. Um, I wasn't sort of dwelling like, well, why am I not bowling? Why am I not bowling? Why? And and Leicester were just going along steadily. They weren't scoring very quickly, so you know. And then I remember like now that I saw I was coming up from fine leg to mid off. And I saw Ozzy, not Ozzy, Tony Lewis, the captain, coming, walking towards me. And he was polishing the ball. And he said to me, well, Speedy, he said, they've all changed. They've all tried. No one succeed. Let's see what you can do. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he said, I wasn't annoyed. I wasn't happy I was going to bowl, nothing. It was just like, well... It's part of my job to do the best I can when asked, you know, and even in between. And he set up, he set up a field. I think he set up a, a five, four field, five on the offside and four on the leg side. And um, I mean, if the other bats, if the other bowlers failed, I mean, there was no chance of me succeeding. And I just ran in and bowled, I think probably bowled a couple of maidens and then then got a wicket. And in the back of my mind, now that I've broken the stand, they may give Aussie or Shep the ball to bowl. So I was probably just coming on for a couple of hours. And I got the first wicket. I got the second one. I got the third. I got the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. And I thought, well, ha, ah, that's great. We've got three bonus points. Not thinking of me, seventh bowler, six wickets, whatever. But um, we went off for, would it have been tea? And I came back out. And he, surprisingly enough, he kept me on because it was always like, you make a breakthrough, then give the great man, Don Shepard the ball, let, his, let him do his magic. So I, I got the seventh wicket. Then I got the eighth wicket kept bowling and I remember bowling one ball to Jackie Birkinshaw. He was the one wicket I didn't take. And it was it was almost a perfect delivery because I have to say a perfect delivery would have taken a wicket. But that ball, Jackie Birkinshaw, a left-handed batsman, the ball swung in, pitched and went the other way and he played a miss. And, you know, the next over from Aussie Wheatley at the other end, I think it was, he got the ninth wicket. And then the following over, I got the, I got the last one. But you're looking back at that um, bowl, with the exception of the intervals, I bowled 24.5 overs, or oh, nearly 25 overs, and got nine wickets at less than two runs and over. Hmm. You know, as a as a fast bowler or somebody above medium pace, you always think in terms of, well, if I can bowl at three runs and over, that's good. So that was that was under that was un, that was under two, three and over. And I have to say about that, you you've heard people saying like so and so was in the zone. Well <laughs> That is what was happening because it it was just happening. I had no control. You run up, you hit the spot, you do the right thing, and the rest will happen. There were um, the wickets were bold and LBW caught a slip, 
caught at leg slip all around the wicket. Nothing was hit out to mid off or mid on. But I remember, I remember going off the field and um, Ray Illingworth. He said to me, "I didn't think you bowled the other one," which was one of those that sort of pitch middle and leg stamp and just not the off stump of the ground. And it was like, you know, it was in a zone. I, I had no control over that whatsoever. Well, there are not many Glamorgan bowlers in the annals of the club, Speedy, who've uh, taken nine wickets. And I'm, I don't think there are many who've taken them in the history of first-class cricket a seventh change, but that's a record they can never take away from you. And of course, we mustn't forget that Colwyn Bay, in recent years, especially with Steve James and Anar and Donald, it's been a bowler's graveyard. Uh, there have been some massive, massive scores there. And I will go back to a game against Lancashire when uh, Ashwell Prince and Alvaro Peterson put on 501 in a partnership. Uh, Maybe we should have uh, sent an SOS to British Columbia for you to come <laughs> over to. Uh, we should have sent. We should have sent an SOS so you could advise how to bowl at Colwyn Bay. Speedy, okay. let's move forward in 1969 to the game in September, early September. Then Glamorgan going up against Worcestershire. Yeah. TV cameras are there. Yes. One more win, and Glamorgan are county champions. For you, you've you've been a in a Glamorgan team that's beaten the Australians in 64, you've beaten the Australians in 68, and now on home soil at Sapphire Gardens, you're so close, so close when the match starts to winning the county championship. And Majid goes out, plays a brilliant innings of 156. Your fellow Bayesian Van Burn holders there in the West in the Worcestershire team. What were your what were your memories of that game? Well, what I what I remember about about that game, it was um, I remember some somebody getting hit. It might have been Roger Davis. Yeah, yeah. And Majid went out on that wicket because it was a it was a bowler's wicket on that particular day. I don't I don't know whether it was prepared specially for that or not, but I wouldn't have thought that you'd prepare a bowler's wicket with Van Burn Holder in the attack for the opposition. But yeah. it, 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 you could bowl on that wicket. And I remember Roger Davis being hit, and Majid going out and getting a hundred, um, a magnificent hundred. I mean, he was smashing it all over the place. I I think Ivy and Jones got hit in that, yeah. in that game as well. Yeah? Yeah. Got, came off and went and had stitches. And and there we were, an, another big crowd, you know, of, um, I think, Glamorgan, <laughs> Glamorgan, the crowds coming to watch Glamorgan was a sort of a leftover from that, that match in 1968 at Swansea with Malcolm versus Gary Sobers. So people sort of came, came to watch us because we had a good year in 68 as well. We finished third in the championship in 68. Yeah, yeah. So, so 19, 1969, and uh, it was sort of, you know, we, we were going with Gloucestershire for the championship, and we, we were playing some serious cricket. And the other thing is that we were unbeaten up to that time. We hadn't lost a game. We, we were unbeaten up to that time. And so the, it, there, was, there was a big crowd, lots of people there, and... Um, we we got into Worcestershire, and I remember again. Uh, I got I got five wickets in that in, in that game. Did I? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it was a it was a great day. It was a a, a it was a, an absolute great day. The the crowds enjoyed the cricket. The cricket was good. We felt good. You know. Yeah, and at just the turn of three o'clock, I think it was on because of course in those days it was three day cricket. Just the turn of three o'clock on the third day, Glamorgan have won, and then the strains of Oh Happy Days and Delilah, uh, you leading the sing song with the boys in the in the old Sapphire Gardens Pavilion. Yeah, yeah, that was um, 
that 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 all happy day we in those days we car we carried music around with us and the dressing room from the from the singing of the welsh for the welsh singing of the hymns and uh, and going on to the beatles and things like that we we just if it rained or anything like that we we just we just sat around in the dressing room we sang i remember tony lewis i i think he played I don't know how much he played, but he played the the cello as a, a young boy or young man, and he he would always um, he liked me to sing a, a song um, by the by the Beatles or Paul McCartney, and they had a, a cello part and they had a long and winding road or yesterday and 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 we just we just love music, and that all happy day song to seem to be a a good song to sing. So um, it was a happy day, not just for us, the players, but for the fans, the spectators, it was a great day. Okay, well, from, from happy days at Sapphire Gardens in 1969 to, oh my goodness, potentially a tragic day at oh. Sapphire Gardens in 1971. The championship game, Speedy, I'm talking about now is against Warwickshire. Malcolm yeah. Nash, Malcolm Nash bowling. Yeah. To Neil Aberley, Roger yeah. Davis, Roger Davis crouching at short leg. Yeah. And of course, it, Roger was struck. Yeah. It was. Now, uh, it was one of those games. It was rain affected where we went off for rain, and an early tea was taken, and of course. Um, we had had lunch and we'd had an early we'd had an early tea, so there was really no need for having a lot of food. And and I remember Roger just had a sandwich and a cup of tea. That's all he had. And then we went back out, and the very first ball, I I don't know whether loosen or what, but it was bang, and Neil Abley just smacked it, and Roger turned. And down he went. Uh, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was an awful moment. And in those days, we knew nothing about um, resuscitation and doing this and doing that. And lucky enough for us all, there was um, two doctors who came and was watching the days play, and we were all stood there waving our arms and I don't know what we were waving for and these two doctors came onto the field and sort of turned Roger, he was on his back and turned Roger to his side and that was the first sort of resuscitation I'd ever seen and having since gone through the course because at the school you were required to go through that that type that type of um, training, and I remember like now, and even going through that course, I remember how the doctors held, turned him on his side, and held his head up, and sort of popped his head back and cleared his throat. And what they said was that that sandwich that he had 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 come back and was lodged in in his throat, which stopped him from, from breathing a bit, but that was, oh, I, I, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, I, I see it every time, every time I see a game of cricket and I see a helmet being worn and I've seen people going out here in local cricket, not in the professional game, people going out to bat without a helmet I, it, it, it comes back to me, comes back to me all the time. And it's, um, it's something you never ever forget. And I, I don't think Roger likes hearing various people talk about it and that sort of thing. But it's something that will be forever in history because he was the first one who um, suffered that, that type of injury, which brought the cricket helmets into being yeah roger roger did uh four years ago speedy he 
he came to the museum here at, at Sophia Gardens yeah. and he spoke to us and it was very moving his his recollections and how he lost his speech and how he had to uh, learn to talk and even walk again. Yes. But um, am I right in thinking that afterwards when the team took, when the Glamorgan team got themselves together, Roger was taken off to the, the hospital for yes. uh, urgent medical treatment. Am I right in thinking that you walked on and said to, to, said to uh, uh, the captain, Tony Lewis, I'm your man. I'll go back there. And you had a motorcycle helmet? No, no, no. It was um it was a a, a hockey helmet. You know, uh what the, the 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 ice hockey helmets that they play in. Okay. It was one of those. And I went to um there was a little sports shop in Key Street. Yeah, yeah, I know. I remember Giles Sports. That, that little one door store. And I yeah. went in looking for something, and there was this, there was this helmet, and I said, I want that. And I looked at it and just put my hat, fit it on, and put my arms around the ears and and whatever. And uh, there was some talk in the dressing room. I think, I think Malcolm Nash said in his book there was a discussion, and Tony Lewis said that he would go and feel there. Well, I mean, if you're a Brian Close, yes. You want to feel there, but I couldn't see. Um, I couldn't see Tony Lewis feeling there, and you know they said, "Well," and I said, "Yeah, I'll go there." But I went out and I got this helmet. Lucky enough for me, I think, and lucky enough for cricket that there was this hockey helmet, and that was the first. I think that was the first helmet worn on a cricket field in, in modern in modern yeah. cricket. Yeah, well, I'm glad. I'm glad to be corrected that it was a hockey, probably the oh, sort yeah. of helmet that a goal that a goalkeeper in hockey would have worn. Uh, well, no, all, uh, all hockey players wear that sort of helmet. It's yeah, a, it's and and also I know I know that uh, hockey umpires also uh, have uh, have worn those. Let's let's talk about the early 1970s, uh, Speedy, because another West Indian cricketer joined Glamorgan around that time, Roy Fredericks. Now, I've only got very brief memories of Roy. Uh, a wonderful innings in 1972 against Northamptonshire at Swansea. Uh, perhaps at a different time, Roy would have gone on to a, a glittering career in county cricket. But what are your memories of him? Roy, Roy, was, a, Roy was a great character. Loved his music. And he too carried around, it wasn't a ghetto blaster, but it was a small transistor radio with a with a cassette. And he would he would have his <laughs> he'd have his soul music playing, you know, he'd arrive and he'd be playing his soul music. Very good batsman. I remember I think he played, he probably played his first game for us against Not at Nottinghamshire. And I think he scored 142, might have been the first game. But I remember the last over before lunch, you, um, it's most batsmen would sort of, you know, let's push around, push around, go off for lunch and come back and start again. But Roy was on 97 or 98 and about the third ball in that last hole before lunch, he just smashed it for four. And the dressing room was like, well, what the hell is he doing, you know? But a good batsman, there's a boundary, half volley, you hit it. And he again was a, a wonderful, wonderful player, great character, loved his music, <laughs> loved his gin and tonic. And he, he fitted into, he, never got serious about anything he would always always laugh uh struck up a great partnership with alan jones as my friend batsman mm -hmm. he would call i think he'd call on alan jones jones boy or bones or something like that and we would call him federal 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 ricks the the welsh people have this way of putting o on everything boyo mm -hmm. you know and so it was federal ricks 
And I remember there was a game at Swansea that he were playing against Northampton and he and Alan Jones opened the batting. They were uh, probably over 200 or something while there was- 330, Speedy. 230. 330. Yeah. And what the, um, well, as, <laughs> as they were batting and, and they were changing over between the overs, we would see some of the Northampton players looking back up at the balcony at Swansea. But what they were looking at is that Majin was sitting there waiting to come into bat. And these two guys were just creaming it all over the place. And they were in fear of Majid sitting there. But he was a, he was a tremendous character, great guy. He, if we move on to uh, the summer of 1977, Majid uh, had left Glamorgan in 1976. We, we won't dwell on uh, we won't dwell on that, but let's look at 1977. You, 10 years on from winning your Glamorgan cap, you'd been awarded a benefit year. Glamorgan hadn't really had much success at all in, in one day cricket, the odd win here or there. Mm -hmm. But then in 1977, you beat Worcestershire in the second round of the Gillette Cup at Worcester, beat Surrey at Sophia Gardens in the third round, and then lo and behold, go to Swansea for the semi-final against Leicestershire. Yeah. A game, a game that because of rain was spread over uh, three days. Oh, and then Gwyn Richards, Spitzy, together yeah. with um Ivion, get mm -hmm. the winning runs at Leicester. And then lo and behold, Glamorgan are in the final of the Gillette yeah. Cup against Middlesex at Lords. Yes. So yeah. uh, what are your memories of uh, of that year? Well, my, my memories of that year and talking about the um, talking about the, the the game and talking about the, the Gillette Cup, what stands out in my memory is a game at Cardiff against Surrey. And the discussion was um, allowing a batsman to have a runner who came to the game actually injured and that was John Edwards. Yeah, yeah. And we allowed that. Alan Jones, a captain, great, great gentleman. I, I couldn't think, I, I couldn't see of any other counter allowing that to happen. John Edwards got injured and the game before he was, um, we didn't know whether he was going to play or not, but then he asked if he could use a runner. He hadn't been on the field. I mean, if if we'd batted first and he was on the field and came off the field with some kind of an injury, well then, yes, you, you allow it. In those days, they allowed a runner. Today, it wouldn't happen. But the fact that they were batting first and Alan Jones, a great gentleman, he is. He said, yes, we'll, we'll allow the runner. And um, we, we pulled off a, a victory there. And then we found that um, we had to play Leicester in the in the semi-final at Swansea. And um, again, uh, I, I think it's very difficult. It's wrong to say you go into a game of cricket thinking that you weren't going to win it because they had some big names and they were they were we were we were a little bit soft in our cricket. I mean we such good gentlemen in Wales. Even if you weren't a gentleman before you joined the Morgan, you became a gentleman, a softy. These guys had some, <laughs> these other countries had some real hard ass plays, excuse me, but, and we didn't think we had a chance, but again, you know, we we pulled it off and off we were, off we were on to, to Lords in the, in the final of the, the Gillette Cup. And that particular day, walking out there, following Alan, walking out onto the hallowed turf at St John's Wood, oh. would that be would that be your proudest moment? Given everything that I know, you've won championship. I know you've beaten Australia, to but to be in the first Glamorgan team ever to play in a one-day final at Lords, 
to walk out and see all the daffodils waving and the, the Welsh flags waving? Well, to be quite honest, um, in every game, in every game that I, uh, in every game of cricket that I've played for Glamorgan was indeed a proud moment. So I, I wouldn't place that above anything. I, I think what happened is the, the, the amazing scene, the amazing scenes of all the daffodils and all the crowds shouting a, a, a packed house. That was more, um, that took my mind, if you like, away from, from the actual game. I was there to, to perform or to do my best for the for the Welsh people, not just who were there on the day, but Welsh Welsh people throughout the the country, and um, it, it it was a good day. I'm very delighted that I actually played in a in a Jilla Cup final. I have a a runners up medal, but um, I wouldn't say that that was my my proudest day. I mean, every day that I played for Morgan, I was really very proud of walking out there with that daffodil and representing the, the the Welsh people. Let's move on a year. A Sunday league match against Hampshire at Portsmouth. I think your figures were something like five for 24. But in that, you actually took a hat trick, but didn't realise you'd taken a hat trick. Is that I, right? I wasn't the only one. It was only after we came off the field and in the dressing room that the that the scorer said hey uh hey speedy you performed a hat trick i said did i he said yeah you got um two wickets for the the with two two the last two balls of the over and then a wicket with the first ball of the next over i mean like no one in the dressing room or in the team realized that i'd taken a hat trick i mean like going going on to the field to perform heroics wasn't part of my part of my cricket at all not at all well i know i've known you for many years and i know you are the consummate team man and it's the team performance that's the most important thing and any personal success is just the icing on the cake but all good careers playing careers have to come to an end and in 1980 you retired and you you took on the mantle of coaching so just talk us through that well i i didn't i, I didn't retire i got a having in 1980 i played every first class game for Glamorgan. didn't miss a minute on the field because of injury or anything like that um, the only two games I didn't play was, um, I think, played one against Sri Lanka, who wasn't, um, who wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, an official test um, country then. And the other one was uh, against India. I think it was on a, a split tour. And um, the, the other person who played in every game, I think, was, was Rodney Antong. He spent every minute on the field. We, I don't think we, we never went on for treatment, never complained of aches and pains and that. I bowled more overs that year than anybody else. And that year took 50 wickets, which probably was more than, than anybody else. So um, to get a phone call from Ozzy Wheatley, who was the chairman at the time, and he just said to me, um, you have to announce your retirement. I said, no, Ozzy, I'm not retiring. And he said, well, we're not offering you a contract. You're coming up to 40 and, uh, and we're, not having you, we're not offering you a contract. So I, I didn't retire. It was said that I retired. I mean, it's like, uh, but that, that's a, I, I, I don't even think it's a, a, a sore point. It was, um, you know, somebody give you a job or they don't give you a job. But I um that that was it. Um you're coming up to 40. And when I look at some of the players, I, I think the Morgan won the championship in 1969. I think was Don Shepard was in his 40s at the time. Would it be? Mm. You'll have to check that. 
But um, I just didn't think, I don't think, I don't think anyone is prepared for retirement. The, the years were sort of up and down, but I was uh, mostly enjoying playing cricket. So then like for everyone in, in every walk of life, the time comes when somebody decides that, you know, you, they say you can't do it anymore. But then if you look two years later, I was 41, nearly 42, and I was asked to come back and help the county out with a, a week of Benson and Hedges cricket. So to me, it was like too old at 40, <laughs> but young enough at 42. So I, it's something that I, I really couldn't understand. So, you know, decisions are made, whether they're made for the best or the worst or the right or wrong, that wasn't for me to, to argue about. You, you played with distinction for uh, several years, as I said, for Cardiff Cricket Club in the Western yeah. League, and I'm delighted there are several former colleagues of yours on the call this evening. But then in 1984, an opportunity came for your wife and your, your uh, you as a family with your son, Jeremy, and your daughter, Carol, yeah. to uh, to go to Canada. Talk us yeah. through that. Well, I, I can say now my, my wife passed um, about 18, 18 years ago. Now, because she isn't here, that uh, I was drag screaming to Canada. <laughs> Because I, I didn't particularly want to leave, uh, leave, leave Cardiff cricket. I'd, um, Glamorgan had finished with me. I'd done some coaching and um, I got back into Cardiff cricket. And it was, it was a fabulous setup with a fabulous bunch of guys. I had um, met up again with people like, um, like um, Paul Good. Um, Couple of other guys, I can't remember, can't remember the name. And I was, um, I was able to uh, coach Michael Kahn. And uh, there was a satisfying moment because I fought like hell to get Caddy onto the Glamorgan staff. And he, he then became a pro cricketer because I, I remember Grinstone in, introducing me to Michael. He was about 16 or 17, 15, 16, 17. And Gwyn said, this young man wants to learn to play cricket. And we think you're the person who can actually teach him. So I, I was happy about that, but I, I was a happy Cardiff camper after, after leaving Glamorgan. And, you know, at the beginning, I didn't play as much for Cardiff as I would have liked to. Because once you become a young professional with Glamorgan, they, there was a guy called um, Bill Edwards. The people, the clubs in the West or the committee men in the West seemed to have the pull as to where you would play your cricket on Saturdays. So I, I played for Cardiff in 62, 63. And then from 64 onwards, as long as I had signed a contract for Glamorgan, you then had to go and play wherever they wanted you to play. And of course, they probably thought that in the West Wales League was the best place for a young cricketer to, to learn his, his trade. Um, it was, they thought it was a competitive league. It was a semi-professional league. It wasn't the same as Cardiff or St. Fagans or the other club, Barry. But with my fight with Michael Kahn, with my fight for Michael Kahn, Glamorgan under Ozzy and Tom, they thought that as professionals, you should play by playing every day was the best way for you to learn. I thought differently. I thought with the kids having to go through that professional setup, Monday to Friday, practice, second team games. And if you lived in Cardiff, and by then we were in a very, very strong league, the Western League, 
I, I thought that um, you shouldn't have to travel to Swansea on a Saturday. And for the, for the guys, the young players who lived in the West, whether they were in the squad on a Saturday morning, you get home on a Friday night from an away game. And let's say, for instance, you're Arthur Francis. You're going all the way down to Cliddock on a Friday night. Then you had to be up early on Saturday mornings and you had to get to Cardiff by 10 o'clock in the morning. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> what, what sort of rest could you have? How, how is your body gonna rest and prepare you for the next day? And if you're not playing, if you're not in the squad on a Saturday morning, why come from Cliddock to Cardiff? And then you go from Cardiff back to Cliddock to start a game at one o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought that was, well, I thought that was terrible. And I, I, I said that. And of course, you know, people didn't agree with you saying that. So, um, but I, I fought, I fought for, like hell for Michael because Cardiff had, we had a pretty strong side in those days. And I thought we'd given Michael Cann the opportunity to come into a, a, a Cardiff team that was, probably nearly as strong as the Gamorgan second team, that he would be, he would be receiving the same sort of coaching that he got from, from Kevin Lyons, okay? And, um, but I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, my, my years with Cardiff were, were absolutely great. And I, I was um, very lucky to be able to finish my sort of playing days in, in Gamorgan. With, with Cardiff, some great guys, great guys, fun guys, good guys. It's great to hear you talk about Michael Cann because he is hopefully one of the Glamorgan players who we'll be talking to in the coming year in 2023. But let's just finish off, uh, uh, Speedy. It's been a wonderful talk this evening. It's been uh, great to hear you reminisce about your own playing career, but I'm sure many people on the call won't know what you've been doing in Canada uh, since 1984. So could you just finish off by just telling us about your, your work at St. Michael's University School? Well, again, that, um, that's the second time in my life that I, I sort of turned up somewhere not knowing what was gonna happen, not really planning, things to happen that way. But I came out to Canada in 19, um, 1984 and the provinces here, British Columbia and uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, even out in um, Toronto, Ontario, all these provinces have the cricket associations. And of course, coming out to Canada, being um, someone who just spent so many years um, playing professional cricket and was a, a good cricket coach, I would say. They had never had anybody like that coming through Canada or coming to live in Canada. So then um, the Canadian Cricket Association, they got in touch with me and they wanted me to go around the provinces giving cricket clinics and, uh, and that type of thing. And then you got the province of, well, Ontario and in cricket in Toronto. It's a hotbed of cricket. They wanted me to come and live and work there. Alberta wanted me to come and live and work there. Um, BC wanted me to, to come and live and work there. And it was like sort of, you go around and you, in a week, you realize like, this is not the place I want to be. This is not the place I want to be. And so settled. I, I came through, I came through BC in 85 and I was in car in Victoria for 10 days and stationed at St. Michael's University School because they were the only cricket school in, um, in Victoria at the time. They were a private school and a lot of the people involved in the school, both teachers and the kids were expats. So cricket was a sport 
that they were used to and they wanted their children to learn. And I was there, I, I came to school, I was there for 10 days um, during the day coaching the kids during, um, it would, during the PE periods. They would come out and we'd go on the pitch and we'd talk and into the nets. And, and I met the headmaster, I was introduced to the headmaster. And he said to me, well, if you're ever back in Victoria, there's a job here for you. So off I went. And then I came back to Victoria in 1986. And I got a phone call which said, the headmaster wants to see you. And off I went. And um, he, he gave me a job. He said, you know, you will assist the director of athletics with um, sort of teaching the kids uh, field hockey skills and you will do cricket, you will do football, which we call soccer here and, and all that sort of thing. And that started in 1986 and ended in 2018 because of the, the pan, pandemic. So I, I finished, I spent 30, 86 to 80, 81, I spent again, 30, 33, 34 years doing something that I never, never really planned to do. So, and I gather that your, your singing skills have been put to great use because before the, the school's uh, sporting events, you've been known to, uh, to sing the anthem. Yeah, well, I, as a matter of fact, we, um, the University of Victoria, is a school and you know universities are, they they play everything they play hockey they play basketball they now even play cricket and as a matter of fact on saturday evening i went up to the university i still sing the anthem there uh twice in the evenings um for the for the girls game or the women's game and then for the men's game so you sing the anthem at five o'clock and then you sing the anthem again at seven o'clock. And, and this has been going on again, never planned it. This has been going on for about 20, 24 years. And I, I'm still very amazed that I can, I can sing or people still want to hear me sing. I was talking to a friend of mine once and I said, and who was talking about me singing? And I said, oh, I, they said, oh, you got a great voice. And I said, Oh, I can't stand my voice. And they said, well, why the bloody hell do you talk so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the uh, the Welsh football team currently out in the World Cup. Um, there's there's some great singing there, but maybe, uh, maybe on your next journey back across to uh, South Wales, mm -hmm. maybe uh, you could do some singing uh, not only for the Welsh football team, but also for Glamorgan. Let me just finish... Speedy, my final question is, uh, I know your son, Jeremy, mm -hmm. uh, has played rugby for Canada. Your nephew, Gerald, of course, Gerald Cordell, played both rugby union and rugby league uh, back in the UK. But I gather your grandson is showing new talents as well. Tell me that. Well, he's, um, well, here in, uh, here in Canada, the, the parents introduce the kids to everything. They introduce them to uh, basketball, football, which we call soccer. Um, not a lot, not a lot of cricket. Not a lot of cricket is done. But in school, you are introduced and you are encouraged to play everything. Um, in the schools during the PE period, they would take you at the side and you will play um, sort of softball, you know, and uh, he just, he, he, he liked basketball because his dad played basketball at high school and of course, football, soccer, but he was introduced to baseball and Jeremy became a, a, a sort of coach or a mentor for him. And, and he, he just went on from various stages until um, there is a, a, a college program 
which he went on to that program. And from that, you do a, a, a program a little bit higher, which is probably a semi-professional program. And that is where he's heading. We don't, um, we don't think in terms that he's begun to become a, a, a player in the big leagues and you know earn all those big contracts and that. It's just that we want him and we support him playing at the highest level. And um, that's where he's at now, right now. But he's never, he probably played one afternoon, one evening of cricket. And, and that's because the team was short and he went out to bat. He didn't take a guard or anything like that. Didn't know anything like that. Picked his bat and the ball, the ball. And he stepped away because in baseball, you don't swing at everything. And he stepped back and the ball went between him and the wickets. And then the wicket keeper sort of went up to him and showed him how to and what. And then he, he hit this ball and he did, he did run with his bat, but he put it under his arm and ran with it. He didn't run with it as you did in cricket. So that's the only game of cricket that he's ever played. He has never played rugby because rugby has become so very fierce. Um, and to me, what coaches are seeing in international games, they are coaching in schools and in clubs. And, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of speculation and there's a, a great amount of talk that um, kids, the game for kids in rugby today is not what it used to be, that, you know, you can get hurt so easily. So people are a little bit afraid of they, they, the kids playing, playing rugby, but rugby is still played on the island. It's great to hear, Speedy, that uh, your grandson is a, a talented baseball player. And uh, if he does go on to, who knows, represent Canada, uh, with your son representing them in rugby, and you having represented Glamorgan, albeit Wales, in, uh, in cricket, it's a great lineage. And it's been wonderful, really, really wonderful this evening, Tony, for you uh, to share your time with us. And uh, I know I speak on behalf of everyone on the call. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful memories. It's lit up an evening. I know uh, tomorrow evening Wales are playing uh, England in the uh, in the World Cup, and uh, I'm sure everyone is going to be uh, wishing the Wales team well. Just in terms of museum talks coming up in the new year, this, as I said, this is the final one of uh, of 2022. But uh, in 2023, Andrew Salter, Colin Ingram, Sam Northeast, and Michael Cam, who you mentioned earlier on, are all wow. lined up to hopefully uh, do a talk. And I know several people on the call this evening have been asking about, uh, are we going to be meeting up in the Cricket Museum at Sophia Gardens? Well, the plan is yes, all being well. What we're going to try and do is have a hybrid meeting, whereby uh, I'll be talking, interviewing in person, the person uh, in the Cricket Museum and we'll have a camera crew so that we can actually do things uh, online. Well, more information about that uh, in due course. It just leaves me to finish off this evening, Speedy, just by saying uh, a huge thanks to you. Uh, we, uh, we hope you continue to thrive and prosper uh, in British Columbia, in BC, where you are. And uh, you know you're always uh, going to be welcome back to Sophia Gardens. If you can make it back to Wales and to see the mighty Glamorgan, the, yes. the team, uh, the team of the 2020s uh, performing and doing well. It just leaves me to finish off this evening by wishing everyone on the call a happy and a prosperous, uh, well, a happy Christmas and a prosperous new year. It'll be I look forward to talking to you again sometime in January, whether it be in person in the Cricket Museum or online. Thank you, everyone, for your support during the year of 2022. And tonight in particular, Tony Cordell, thank you so much for your time and sharing so many happy memories with us. Diochen Varian. Thank you very much. Thank you.